Thank you very much, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in a lucky position because I have spoken after my colleagues from other EW companies. I'm in the unlucky position that I'm the last speaker, which means that you all want to go to tea. Um, I appreciate that, and I shall try to be brief. Okay, what I'm going to talk about is a major United Kingdom program called CDAS. CDAS is a common defensive aid system architecture. I really want to use it to illustrate a collaborative approach to producing the optimum electronic warfare and survivability solutions. Okay, just a quick overview. The program is currently a technology demonstrator program. This is something that the UK conducts before putting equipment into service. In fact, this program has already rolled out things that have gone into service, as you'll see in a short while. It's primarily about creating an open interface for defensive aid systems. I've been asked to talk about EW today because that's our discussions we've been having with DARE. The techniques we use are also used in our ISTAR systems to create open ISTAR systems. And you'll understand in a while what I mean by open. We're trying to look for a way to join together pieces of equipment made by different manufacturers, different design teams, to go onto aircraft designed by different engineers using different interface and bus architectures. So it's trying to create something like the model we have with our PCs and USB type interfaces and not the model that Apple have where once you buy an iPad or an iPhone, everything else in your house needs to be I this, I that. Okay? So think open USB type architectures, not closed Apple take all your money architectures. Okay? We've demonstrated the technology using advanced hostile fire indicators. Um, we're also developing acoustic, uh, which we've proven on helicopter trials. We've got missile warning systems, laser warners, radar warners, and directed infrared countermeasure systems. And we've demonstrated the use of a controller that monitors what they're all doing and selects the appropriate tactics. So the UK is very pleased with this. It's rolling it out, trying to get it adopted as a model in NATO. We're getting good progress in America. It's a, an approach that is also open to any other person who wants to use it because the interfaces are going to be published open. What drives it? Well, my history has mainly been looking at threat systems. So out there in the world are lots of threats. And I'm going to focus on helicopters because that's what's been causing problems for the United Kingdom armed forces in Afghanistan particularly, trying to protect them from guns and unguided rockets. So all those threats there have signatures in the electromagnetic domain or as acoustic signatures. So, realistically, what have we done? Well, I think Uri's last presentation showed the problems that they're trying to address by putting everything into one solution. Because what happens is procurement agencies buy one system for missile warning, one system for hostile fire indicators, one system for low band jamming, one system for high band jamming. So the future, we can put them all in one box. But right now, there are platforms today that have them in many boxes distributed around the platform. And I've seen helicopters where the pilot has to look at one display for the radar warning receiver, one display for the laser warning receiver, one display for the missile warning system, one display for a hostile fire indicator, and there's also controls for all of those. And one nation I know very well went to war in Kosovo with their Apaches and switched everything off because the pilots found it too confusing. So basically, we must simplify this. So an integrated defensive aid system, I think everyone accepts the case that if you can pull all the information together and present a single picture, you will get a better response 
if the crew are involved, and if you pull all the data into a common processing box, you can get better tactical responses. You also are able to collect data, play the data back at the end of missions, and do live replays. So, as an example, during the operations over Libya, uh, the British Apaches went into the country. On the first night, we had a few engagements. Um, one of the crews didn't actually do quite the right manoeuvre, um, but our, our defensive aid controller saw that he was braking in one direction when he should have gone the other way, and we changed our mind about the tactic, so used the countermeasures in a different way. He obviously survived uh, because you didn't hear any losses reported. Uh, what we were also able to do was to record the fact that a number of the radars um, in the country were operating on unknown frequencies, and we were converting and changing the, the responses overnight. So we were, we were able to replay, recall, um, and analyze, and change the data overnight. Okay, so as a company, uh, the company I'm now with, Celex, ES, if you go back far enough, we were Marconi and Ferranti and other companies. And we've been involved in defensive aid systems from the first one I was involved in was Zeus, uh, which went on to the RAF's Harriers. And then there's a long history. Now, most of those systems were fully integrated EW systems where they shared hardware. But the Royal Navy were the first people to say, actually, our ships already have radars. They already have EW. They already have chaff dispensers. What we need is something that will coordinate them. So right at the top of that list, there's a system called UCB. And UCB was a commercial computer running software that took all the data off the data highways and made decisions. And it presented those decisions to the EW director on the ship and presented him with the best options. That came out after the Falklands War because you know we had some problems with exosets um, where we didn't always do the right thing to defeat them. And the idea of having a central computer that runs standard software which users can edit is at the heart of the CDAS system. So it starts from the system that is on the Apache, used by the British, also by the Kuwaitis um, and by the Greeks. Uh, and this is a fully integrated system, but it was designed to work through an open architecture to the helicopter. Boeing insisted that we conformed to an absolutely standard message set and to use certain electrical interfaces. So at the heart of this system, one of those boxes acts as the coordinator and collects all the data from the other sensors. And they're made by different companies. There's a TALIS dispenser system. There's a BA Systems Missile Warner. Um, so we use lots of different manufacturers' systems. Boeing was so happy with this that they asked us to take out the software element and put it in a small processing box, which is now on every new build and remanufactured Apache. It's called the AGP. That's Aircraft Gateway Processor, which is a really exciting name. But it's actually just a PC. Uh, really, it's a small, ruggedized PC with a lot of interfaces. Um, that lives in the middle of the uh, Apache, connected to all the radar warner, missile warner, and so on pieces, all of which are made by different manufacturers. So one of its jobs is to take data from all of those different devices through different electrical interfaces and convert them into common digital message types. The British MOD was looking at this and working with one of the scientists in DSTL, which is equivalent of DARE, uh, they identified that the little box we were using on the American Apache was just what we needed for an upgrade to our Chinooks and Pumas. And so the DAS controller was put on board to link again a lot of different systems on the Chinook uh, and to allow them all to talk and communicate, giving new displays and new tactics. And that's now been in service um, with the UK in Afghanistan for a couple of years. So at the heart of everything I'm talking about here is common digital methods of exchanging data and decision making. Some of the software algorithms we use were not written by Celex ES people, they were written by people outside and they're brought in as pieces of applications into the system. So the program that we've actually been running is managed by DSTL, they are the technical directors 
of the program. Uh, my company, which last year was called Celex Galileo, is the lead contractor, and we're working with Talis, Kinetic, and BA Systems on bringing together all the component parts. I've already said it's about a standardized and adaptable architecture that allows you to add new components. It's about something to allow modular upgrade. So if a supplier creates a new transduction element, a new sensor, maybe one that works at a different part of the frequency band, provided the data they output is to one of our formats, then we use it. And if needs be, we'll put a converter in our box, but we would prefer the supplier to conform to the interface standard. This allows us then to make highly optimized decisions about the correct response to make when threatened. As a very simplistic view, what the UK did was we looked at every single system fit that we had on all of our platforms, identified all the different sensors and effectors, and tried to establish if we understood how they communicated with the aircraft. So working with the manufacturers, we agreed that we could move them all to a standard message type, which we implemented um, through a, a gigabit Ethernet interface. Many people don't like Ethernet on military platforms. The UK has accepted that with proper switched fabric, it is totally predictable and it will always work in the way you ask it to. We're able to move video data around from those devices that have cameras in them. So the DIRCOM, Directed Infrared Countermeasure System, has a camera for fine tracking so we can get the camera pictures out and recorded. So we're not just recording digits like numbers, we're also recording video from our systems as well. The key way we do this is with a, a publish-subscribe interface system. So every box publishes the information it's creating, puts it onto the bus, and anybody who has subscribed to that device can listen to its data. This means we don't have to route everything through a central hub. So the communication between the missile warning system and the DIRCOM, which must be really fast, can take place by direct communication, and the DAS controller just sits and monitors the activity and says, OK, I'm happy with that, let it continue. To allow this to work, you've got to define some message types. And what we found was that every manufacturer was producing a message that only contained the data that their sensor could measure. Actually, what you want to know is that it can't measure this, and it can't measure this, and that when it does measure this, it's to a certain accuracy. So in the message, we have a basic header block that is very, very standard, and then behind it, we have a metadata block that can contain extra information. Again, if I may use an analogy, it's like if you have an MP3 music player and you can have the actual music file, the MP3, but you don't have to have the picture of the, the track artist, you don't have to have the album cover, you don't have to have the composer, but you can if you want. So we've defined an absolutely standard header which contains the critical information, things like the timestamp, the angles, and if possible, range. But the metadata can contain all the justification for why that message was sent. The trials themselves have been operating, as I said, over a period of three years. In 2010, 2011, we did our first flying on a linked helicopter, but most of the work was done on a ground test rig. I'll show you a little bit about the ground test rig in a moment. The main thing that we were trying to do was to integrate the data from different sensors. So we had um, an infrared missile warner and kind of picture creator. We had a UV missile warner and we had infrared based uh, laser warners. In addition to that, we had a Durkham turret, so a small pointing tracker system with a camera and we were demonstrating the handover of data from missile warning systems uh, to the, to the, the DIRCOM primarily. 
During phase two, we changed the architecture, added more of the open message sets. Uh, we added a dual head Durkham, so we now had a Durkham on both sides of the helicopter. We added some new tactics modules and some new missile warning systems. And at the tail end of last year, we, we actually flew the flight trials. Now, when we were doing the ground trials, we realized that a helicopter flying around an environment with many threats around it was quite expensive. Each trial was taking a long time. What we wanted to do was test all of the message handling at high speed and very accurately. So we were looking around, and we found that in the film, The Golden Compass, so a big box office success, we found that they were using a motion table and they put a person on top of the motion table and they move it around. And then behind it, they have the blue screen. And so when the polar bear is moving around in the golden compass, it's using this motion table here to create the motion of the polar bear and the actor sits on top. What we found was that the control of this was so precise that it was better than most of the military type uh, multi-axis tables. And it was a lot cheaper. So in the course of only about, I think it's about six days, we did 1,200 test simulations. We had threat simulators down in the trees in the distance on the right of that picture, about sort of anything up to about five kilometers away. And we were throwing this, this head system around. So up on, up on the rig there, you can see up on the top, we've got missile warning systems and the laser warning systems are all on the, the pods. And underneath the pod is a dome down here. And that's one of the Durkham systems, and the other one is on the other side. So we were able to create multiple ambushes with SAMs in various places in the trees and people with gunfire. And we got some really excellent results. Uh, the, the video is not particularly exciting, but it's just to show you the kind of uh, motion. Sorry. should just start. Where's the mouse gone? Nope. Right, we're not going to be able to run that today. We tested it beforehand. Okay, so the flight trial took place in November, and we were running on a Lynx Mark 7. So the, the UK keeps some helicopters and aircraft permanently for trials. The Lynx 7 is the one we use for all the DAS trials. And you can see hanging on the side of it is one of the, the pods with all the sensors in it, and again with their Durkhams at the bottom. We were flying here against a number of um, threats, gunfire, we were using blanks. Um, on our hostile fire indicator missions, we actually fire live rounds because we rely on some of the um, sonic effects that happen as a bullet go past. But you'll be pleased to know we've been using an unmanned helicopter for that. Um, the pilots don't like being shot at. So the, the trial was three weeks, we did many sorties, and we had all the data recorded for immediate and post trial analysis. So I think the message I want to leave there is that this approach of going for an open message set allows you to join together many different component systems from different manufacturers without uh, too much impact on the aircraft. In particular, the Americans in Boeing were very, very pleased with the fact that we were making changes to systems like HIDAS on the Apache without interfering with the aircraft avionics. So the aircraft is certified with our AGP box, and the British ones are certified with the DAS controller. And the people who do the certification have said, we are very happy for you to change your interfaces to EW systems, to add extra EW systems, and you do not need to recertify the aircraft because we've proven that your box isolates the aircraft from the impact of the other systems, which is really important. So I just wanted to conclude, really, by saying multispectral threat systems, we're looking at platforms where they have many sensors which have been bought over time and which are being upgraded continuously. Most of the British platforms, we don't have enough money to completely update the platform. We have to do it through incremental upgrades. And that means we're having to deal with many manufacturers at the same time. And we've been really pleased 
that all of the EW manufacturers who supply the UK have so far agreed to support the CDAS program, even though it is led by a rival company. It's viewed that we're working on behalf of the nation rather than the interests purely of the company. So what is it? It's an open interface for a defensive aid system. It's been developed by the UK and industry in a very open collaboration. It can be used for any DAS sensors and effectors, provided they either conform to the interface standard or let us write an interface module. We've proved it through implementation and trials. We're seeing no time delays by using these standard approaches. Many manufacturers said, oh, yeah, if you make the messages more complex, it'll slow everything down. We've proved that that does not happen. We demonstrated a lot of new equipment, so much so that now the UK MOD gets a new sensor and they try it in the CDAS architecture, either in the test rig or on the helicopter. And basically, for the users, it does what they want. It gives them a common interface and a proven set of tactical responses. A helicopter pilot moving from an Apache to a Chinook to a Puma sees the same interface the same controls and knows to do the same tactical manoeuvres and does not need to understand how the EW equipment works. So it's a, a really good thing for training, through life maintenance costs. So I think it's a good thing and it's something which we're, we'd like to discuss further with anyone who's interested. So thank you very much for your attention. Your cup of tea awaits. Thank you, Steve. Uh, actually, uh, this is heartening to see that somebody is trying to look at things in a unified manner. But I want to tell you something, in spite of uh, the openness of the architecture of the PC, uh, the Apple guys are slowly creeping in. They don't go Apple. <laughs> the second thing I wanted to, from the user perspective, uh, is most of these uh, sensors uh, need improvement over time. And uh, collecting data is uh, uh, imperative in any mission. So adding a common recording interface to this will also help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, you're absolutely right, sir. Very good comment. Okay. Uh, any other? One question, please? Thank you very much. Oh, there was. One question is this. One question. So, so you have mentioned about uh, these, uh, whatever the technology we are using over there, won't interfere any flight avionics. Yeah, that's true. That the, the How it's possible. Right. Clearly, as we were discussed in various other parts of this, if you introduce a new transmitter unit onto a platform, whether it be radio frequency or infrared, then you have an interoperability issue. Okay, so the jammer, if you add a new jammer, then you clearly need to clear the jammer on the aircraft. The point about flight certification is that people want to make sure that the mission um, avionic computer is not prone to problems with other messages. So, for example, using 1553 buses, there have been instances where data messages have gone onto one bus, find their way through something that sits on two buses, and get through and interfere with the flight controls and displays. So what we've done is we've isolated all of the EW systems are absolutely guaranteed, isolated from the rest of the data structure. So it's about data protection, not EMC. Does that make sense? Uh, exactly, sir. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve Roberts, for your scintillating and uh, penetrating in information on a EW system. <laughs> <laughs>